Hey everybody and welcome to Let's Look at Creepy Castle. This is a new game, uh, well I mean you can see who made it down there at the bottom, developed by Dopterra and published by Nicholas, the company probably at least most of you guys would know, uh, because they published The Binding of Isaac Rebirth and Afterbirth and then of course, uh, Afterbirth Plus, which is coming out soon, and other stuff like It'll Do 2, which is coming up. Tiny Barbarian DX, etc., etc. Anyway, this is Creepy Castle. This was a game that was kickstarted in the autumn of 2014 for a really modest sum. I think they were asking for $6,000 American. They made $8,000. The game came out two years later. Not a Star Citizen situation, to say the least, but it's finally out. Uh, I actually had the chance to preview this at PAX West, and I will start this by saying that it's a niche game. You know, this is the kind of game that it, it's not gunning for a broad audience. It's not painting with broad strokes. Uh, instead, this is something that's very quirky. It's a adventure RPG in the style of almost like either NES games or even like, you know, Amiga games or something like that. It's got a nice sense of humor, a good tone, uh, and a battle system that at least tries to break up the monotony a little bit. $15 on Steam, $13.49 for its opening week sale in American dollars. Uh, we're gonna get started here. I have 38 minutes into uh, one scenario. There's actually a lot of content uh, available in the game, as you'll see here, but... Uh, that 38 minutes represents one death that cost me like 10 minutes because I didn't go back and save, which is my own fault, but also a little bit of a bummer. Anyway, um, we have maybe like eight scenarios here? Yeah, eight scenarios. I'm on the first one here, which is Creepy Castle. I believe that these unlock after you beat this one, and I've, again, put basically an hour into this one, uh, if you count the time that I messed up my save on, uh, and I've beaten a few bosses and I've not completed this scenario yet, so it's actually, like, a, a pretty robust game, uh, at least in terms of the amount of content that it has, apart from, you know, maybe, I know from an asset standpoint, this isn't gonna be the kind of thing that's, uh, you know, knocking it out of the park from everybody's perspective, but it does do a, a pretty remarkable job of aping that 8-bit style, although I have turned on a smoothing filter because uh, the kind of like segmented way that it was drawing frames like every time you move over it redraws the entire scene was making me a little bit ornery anyway um, we're gonna just restart like a brand new save file here in the creepy castle so I can do my best to explain to you the mechanics of what's going on in the game on the horizon a castle like shadow became stone or like a shadow becomes stone from its walls seep tales of dark conspiracy within and to investigate comes the vagrant swordsman moth coming all this way has been an endeavor on its own even for a soul of his wanderlust but the real trial was only beginning, and though he was no stranger to happening upon the shady machinations of conspirators, little could he ever suspect the immense gravity of what would transpire in this creepy castle. Roll credits. It's a game that, um, certainly, if you're gonna get your money's worth out of it, you're gonna wanna read everything that comes up, because the tone, again, is, is part of what drives it. Uh, I know you're probably wondering what's up with the black bars on the side of the screen. The game runs in 4x3. It might actually be one by one instead of four by three. But again, it's it's aping that style almost, you know, to excess, depending on your perspective. This looks like a training ground. Use the confirm button to read signs and brush up on your know-how. Um, basically, what I want you to pay attention to is that flashing white circle at the bottom of the screen. Essentially, uh, what this does is this is our inventory system that we can use to eat food primarily to generate HP and also use keys to open locked doors and stuff like that. But this indicates the actions that we're going to be doing, not just our inventory. So uh, that'll change in context depending on what we come across. So we've come across a sign. The sign says basic training. Action command. You can always use the next and previous item buttons to highlight your action command. Depending on context, this is used to attack, open chest, save, and more. So you'll see as we get going here. Now, the attacking system in the game is going to start out by looking really rudimentary, but this actually ends up being one of the defining characteristics of the gameplay loop, and I think one of the strongest things that uh, that kind of keeps the monotony from piling up too much once you actually get a little further in. Right now, we're just going to hit A. I'm using controller for now, but you can easily use keyboard and mouse as well. And it'll um, hit an enemy. We'll get into more nuanced combat later. It never becomes, you know, Absolver necessarily, but you, you do get to do some almost like minigame style WarioWare uh, s combat here. I've lost the ability to speak apparently. Those stars are just particle effects. I don't believe they indicate that we've gotten uh, any experience or anything else. This weird looking uh, shrimp here is uh, our key. Using items with the next and previous item buttons, you can highlight any item and use it like such. That's just the bumpers here. So we're gonna go over here. Keys don't unlock uh, doors automatically. You have to walk up and use them. And they're just telling you here that there is no fall damage. So this is us entering the creepy castle. By the way, this is um the 
uh, border system that's going on in the game right now that's almost like, you know, original Game Boy Color-esque or something like that. Um, that's something that I put on custom. There's a, a bunch of different, almost like Downwell-esque uh, shaders that you can use. We can show those, off in the, uh, show those off in the options menu later. Another thing I'd like to point out, I hope it's coming across in the mix right now, but the music is actually really, really good. As much as, to some extent, like, I didn't grow up with games that were 8-bit. I was more of a 16-bit kid. Uh, just because of when I was born, basically. Uh, I don't have that much built-in nostalgia for games like this. This might even be 4-bit, to be honest with you. But uh, I don't have that much nostalgia for games that look like this, built-in. Like I would something that looks like Super Metroid or Owlboy, for example, uh, that's more contemporary. But the music is extremely well done. Like, I don't know, if I'd say like on the same level as Shovel Knight, maybe, maybe not. But, but really, really remarkable. Alright, so we're just going to continue bashing enemies here. Your goal is nebulous. I'm not really sure what the final goal of the Creepy Castle scenario here is. I've just been wandering through the castle, killing bosses as I happen upon them. This is a save point. Um, I can't remember. I definitely did go this way earlier. Uh, along the way, you're, you're going to meet a cast of colorful characters, sometimes literally colorful. This guy says, hey there, I'm Locke. I'm looking for a certain key. I can tell you about the different kinds of keys. Golden keys like this one are used to open normal doors. Uh, there are abnormal doors that will come across as well, but some characters, you know, want to use you, some of them want to be used by you, some of them want to abuse you, and some of them, I think, to be honest with you, might want to be abused. I'm hoping we get uh, a little bit more of a tutorial coming up here in just a second that uh, indicates the new styles of combat that we can actually get involved with. But first, I was right to come here for who knows how long. I have wasted my time stumbling through the night in hunt of a shadow, but no more. I shall remain right here at the crossroads of fate. Poised to strike, something big is brewing here, and I intend to stir the pot. This is Monsoon's Log, um, which, let's just try not to equate that with what happens in the toilet at a game convention on the third day. But, uh, Monsoon is a boss that we'll fight throughout the, the first mission here, the first scenario. I'm not sure if you fight him after the first time, but considering he's the tutorial boss, I wouldn't be surprised if they engage in the common trope of bringing him back later as a little bit of a big bad. Uh, for years I've subsisted on rage alone, often with nary a trace of my mark. Yet in the mere days since my arrival, multiple potential leads have presented themselves to me. All I have to do now is pace myself. I shall work towards my new master's ambition, but I must never forget why I'm really here. Cool story, bro. What's the point of having a journal if you're gonna leave it so far away from your actual place of residence? You're never gonna get into a good habit of, of you know, using that journal. If you don't have it next to your bedside or something. Okay, so we got some bread. Just a slice of bread. This gives us HP. There's various different kinds of uh, food that we'll encounter here. And this is a good uh, idea for you to get a little bit of the tone of the game. Food Operator's Manual. A long day's work will often leave the body wearied. Thankfully, when we lose our stamina, there is a solution to exhaustion. The consumption of food. Different foods will restore stamina to varying degrees. The extent of a foodstuff's restorative capability is conveyed at the top of the screen to the right of your level when a foodstuff is selected. There is an experience system in the game, but it's not like you killed these this many enemies or you got a crit that gave you bonus experience. Rather, you collect relics that contribute to your level growing. And I'm not even sure what you get when your level grows. Um, it's all kind of kept behind the scenes or maybe even just aesthetic. Um, but again, that it's not a mechanics-driven game for the most part. It's a game that's really, if it's going to succeed for you, and that's honestly a big if. Like, this is certainly a game where your mileage may vary, myself included. But if it's going to survive there, it's going to be that kind of, like, Undertale, quirkiness, self-awareness, turning gaming tropes on their head to some extent. Um, to consume a foodstuff, press your action button when the appropriate foodstuff is selected. Place the food in your mouth and begin the mastication process using your mandibular function teeth and tongue to exert force and crush your food. When the food is when the food is well ground and sufficiently lubricated with saliva, commence swallowing by relaxing your throat muscles, opening up your sphincter and moving the chewed food to the back of your mouth with your tongue. The food will then slide in the esophagus. Automated digestion will follow and nourish your body through absorption of nutrients. Between and after swallowings of food stuff fragments, be sure to resume breathing. See chapter one. Have a nice day. That's from Point Dexter, another character we'll meet here. So I recognize that probably a lot of you watched me or listened to me read through this and said that is like too precious I hate it I think that's okay and this is a great sign that Point Dexter should be sending you off right now and you should probably look into a different game um, but for those of you who read this and were like oh it's kind of cute and quirky and self-aware um, you might just be the audience that uh, Creepy Castle is looking for I don't know if we can blow up that wall by the way I another thing like 
it does have a rudimentary uh, map system in the game, which I think is, you know, in keeping with the tone of the game. It's historically accurate, I suppose. Um, but at the same time, I, I do sort of wish it had the ability to scroll back and forth between this, but, uh, or like, to scroll the map so I could see even further back. Maybe it's unnecessary, maybe uh, it's not really meant to be that exploratory, but sometimes I found myself being like, I, I just wish I could get like a pulled out, zoomed out view of things. And this is what I mean when I say that sometimes it might even work against the game's favor that it, you know, is so inspired by these classics that it's sort of become those. You know, they had limitations, which are cute to replicate, but not necessarily a great gameplay decision for people like me who are terrible at, uh, you know, keeping a mental map of where they're going. And I know, Bow, back in my day, we used to have to draw it on graph paper. Well, good for you, okay? This ain't your day anymore, Grandpa. Quick Draw. Sometimes when fighting an enemy, a duel will be initiated. They come in quite a few flavors. Quick Draw is one such flavor. So duels are basically mini-games that happen um, when you face an enemy. There's a wide variety of them. Some of them have you mashing, you know, left and right in the D-pad. Some of them are timing-based games, like this one is going to be. And some of them are like sequence-based games, almost like a really, really small DDR or something like that. And you'll see those as we play here. So this first one is just timing. It says duel and we duel. We got him there. Not every uh, bit of combat, even with an enemy that you duel with, is going to be a duel. Some of them are just going to be press A and you hit them, like that one, for example. And that's our first bit of experience there, which has uh, caused us to level up to level 2. I'm going to eat this bread when we land, just because like, there's no reason not to eat this bread. If there's a principal complaint I have about the game, it, it's not actually the tone. Um, it, and it's it's not the graphical style. I can get over that. That doesn't really bother me. Sometimes you have to struggle to get away from an or an endurance, endurance attack, I should say. Uh, I'm going to ignore this just for a second while I talk. The biggest thing for me is that it's mechanically so... I'm trying to think of the word. It, it's mechanically very simple. So for me, I find myself playing it and having a reasonably okay time, but then becoming bored a little bit and wanting to alt-tab because there's not that much strategy. Like, you get a piece of food, and it's not really like... When should I use this piece of food? At least in my experience so far, if a piece of food will heal you uh, without overhealing you, like for example, if you have 10 HP, your max HP is 12. You don't want to eat something that gives you 4 HP because you're wasting two. As long as it fits in under your max health bar, that's about as far as the strategy goes. When I see locks, I use my keys. You know, when I see a key that matches a, a lock's color, I use that colored key. And apart from that, it's not like you really have to think too hard about what item you're actually going to use. So I do find that a weakness of the game to some extent is that mechanically it's just not, uh, it, it doesn't invite itself uh, into being played strategically so much as just, you know, being there in the moment. That being said, uh, I do like the mini games. I think the mini games keep things a little bit more interesting in combat here. Um, so for example, I mean, as you saw right there, um, we had the left and right on the D-pad combat. It's the kind of thing that I, I think could wear thin over a, a relatively short amount of time. However, it's certainly better than just walking up to an enemy, pressing A, and then, you know, they hit, you hit them, they hit you, you hit them, they hit you. Uh, there's also traps in the game, so you can actually spot them, which I didn't notice the first time through, but if you look at the uh, ceiling tiles, you can see which ceiling tiles are going to break here. I don't know if we do more damage maybe when we level up. That obviously didn't level up. We picked up another key there. Um, and we might be able to level up again here in just a second. There's also uh, lore that you find throughout the game that's not necessarily just, you know, a book that you read and it teaches you mechanics about the game. Instead, this is, um, uh, this is just to kind of flesh out the world of the Creepy Castle and teach you a little bit more about the characters who live here. Which again, if you're going to be interested in the game, this is going to be one of the reasons you would be. Oh man, where do I start? Today! My living conditions in the worst department ever continue as terribly as expected. They assured me that I'd get nothing but the best accommodation in the castle. Ha! What a joke! I turned on the tap and water came rushing out immediately and it didn't stop until I turned it off again. This is crazy. Can't they see how dangerous it is? What if someone broke into my place and turned it on just to drown me? I can't believe they failed to account for that. I've never thought about that, but that's yet another thing that will keep me up at night now. Yesterday I opened my window, revealing an amazing sight of the nature on the outside of the castle and flooding the room with sunlight. What is this madness? How could I ever convince myself to go outside in my free time now that I have access to something almost as good from the comfort of my room? They are clearly trying to assassinate my long-term health and fitness. I can't believe I have to live in this squalor when the people down the halls have it so good. One guy gets to hear poetry anytime he wants for free! That stuff is not even released in print yet. Another one has an infinite supply of top quality all-natural vines. R.I.P. Vine. I am green with envy. But that's not even the worst. One of them literally lives in a convertible. He can remove the roof whenever he wants. My roof can't do that. This is discrimination. 
I'll raise hell with these dung beetles in management. No, in this game, the, the, the landlord may actually be a literal dung beetle. Alright, we need to pick up like a donut or something here and get ourselves healed. There we go. It's a dog eat hot dog world. Again, I really cannot stress enough that that is the tone of the game. So if you find yourself not really having a great time uh, listening to it, all I can really say is get used to it if you want to play Creepy Castle or stay far, far away. I actually think that, you know, the the impression that you might be getting right now is that I don't like this game. And that's not the case. Uh, this, this is our DDR minigame here. Um, that's not the case. I'm just trying to, and maybe I'm erring a little bit too much on the side of uh, caution, but I'm trying to get across that this is not a game uh, for everybody. This is not even a game that's like, you know, some people will love and some people will think it's just okay. This is a game that some people are going to love and some people are going to be like, I actually hate the way that it's... Uh, that it's coming across here. I hate that tone, you know, a lot of people, uh, it, it won't resonate with. That being said, I actually think that that's totally fine. You know, not every game for, can be for every person, and the fact that this is kickstarted, and, uh, we need one more key here before we can open those locks. Um, the fact that it was kickstarted, and, and, you know, a, a group of people, or a, a plethora of people, I guess, have made a decent amount of money, um, who actually had an interest in the game can go play it for themselves and, and, you know, look at it and be like, this is a game that I think I would like, so I'll finance it. That's great. I'm glad it exists. And, um, certainly it's not hurting me by being here. So this is just teaching us about speeches, basically. Have you come to investigate what's going on around here? It's getting dangerous. I'm going to escape. You would be wise to do the same. Good thing I can use the map by pressing the pause button. I already told them that, you joker. Um, but yeah, all, all I'm really trying to get at is... Not every game has to be everything for every person. I demoed this at PAX and I was like, this is cool. It's it's not my style of game necessarily, but it's um, it's novel enough that I wanted to play it for myself. And now I've played it for myself and I probably will not finish it, but um, I, I found it somewhat enjoyable nonetheless. And I actually think that maybe this is something that I would, in principle, recommend to people who are uh, a little bit, uh, you know, more on the Knicks side of the spectrum. You know, the people who will read dialogue like that and be like, oh, that's cute, I like that. Even though, you know, for for someone like me personally, I'm kind of like, okay, but I want to have a top-down isometric strategy game where I manage supply chains, blah, blah, blah. This is, is like the anti that. Monsoon, you? What are you doing here? Seems that fate has destined our weapons to clash once more. All right, so now we got a boss fight. One of several I've had in the early game here. This, usually, I think these are opportunities for the game to um, amalgamate, like, all of the mini games, All the different styles of combat. So we're going to do duel, we're going to do sumo, and we're going to do, uh, or we might not do sumo, but we're definitely going to do duel and um, escape. We're also going to press A a lot and watch his health bar go down, which is by far my least favorite of all the... Any games. Now, having defeated him, I mean, we're a little bit on the short side for a, uh, a let's look at here, but I, I kind of think I've covered my bases. We've leveled up again. I honestly have, like, no idea what that actually does. I can't eat this. It's looking at me. Well, I pressed the action button, so unfortunately for you, we totally can. Um, it's a bit of a, a game that defies characterization to some extent. Maybe because I don't have a strong history, you know, in my earlier life of, uh, uh, of playing games like this. But it's, it's certainly a, a novel game. And that's, you know, not meant as a backhanded compliment. Not necessarily 100% my style, but I really appreciate the, uh, you know, the WarioWare style stuff they've got going on here. I think it's got heart. And I'd rather play a game that has heart than a, uh, and doesn't necessarily succeed at it from my, uh, expectations. It, um, than a game that is just completely, you know, devoid of charm. It certainly has charm. Whether or not that charm resonates you, with you is a uh, another thing altogether. Um, but yeah, I think we've, we've pretty much covered our bases here. You know, there's a few other mini games, but at this point, uh, if if you don't like what you've seen, I don't think that seeing uh, like a tic tac toe style game or a, a pipe dream style game is really going to change your uh, opinion of things. And if you like what you've seen, I, I think that that is just even more likely to reinforce that you do like it. So, uh, again, let's take our little, uh, let's, let's take a pause here on the right side. Apologies for a little bit of a shorter episode. We'll go check out the palettes before we finish this, just in case, like, what you're watching right now really offends you. I do think it's important. Like, it's funny that you, when it comes to, like, comparisons between me and Total Biscuit, people are like, NL, you know, just plays the game. TB really goes in-depth, especially with stuff like the options menu, which I think is really good and important for PC gaming. So he'll play, you know, like, the new Call of Duty, and then look at the options menu and 
toggle with that and be like, this is what's good about it, this is what's bad about it. I'm like, ah, whatever, just load it up on default seven, settings uh, 720p windowed. But then we're playing a game that, you know, looks like it came out in 1985, and I'm like, okay, check out these display settings, though. But you can see, you know, you can have an HP bar, you could have hearts and an HP bar, you could have just hearts. Um, you can go full screen or not full screen, I'm not going to do that. You can adjust the scale uh, when you're in windowed mode to make it larger or smaller. And then for shader, you can go no shader, which is looking like, you know, an emulated NES game or something like that. Then this is, looks like we're playing it on our grandma's TV. Uh, that looks like, you know, somebody turned the brightness up all the way, even though it told them to only turn the brightness up until they could see the faint outline of the dragon. Uh, and then this is, like, the other two uh, filters, or shaders, which I think is good. Uh, normal palette and various other palettes. Um, it's, like, super down welly right here. I don't like Sundown. I mean, Minus World 1's okay. Border, that just changes the border that's around your uh, UI elements here. It's nice either way. And uh, movement style, 8 pixel, basically just it redraws your character every time you move. Um, whereas smooth, horizontal, and vertical, you, it, it feels a little bit more modern, I guess. You, a little bit less authentic, but a little bit more modern and less likely to make you maybe a little nauseous. But anyway, this is Creepy Castle. Where's its heart on its sleeve? I think it does a good job of, uh, you know replicating or paying homage to the games that it's inspired by. Not necessarily 100% my cup of tea, but quirky enough that I think for a lot of people out there, it will actually resonate with them. For those that doesn't, eh, probably buyer beware on that. But uh, for those that does, I think you'll find it uh, quite charming. For now, it's available for $13.49 during its opening week sale on Steam, or $15 if this is after the week of, like, November 5th, 2016. For now, thanks for watching. Hope you guys have enjoyed the episode. If you did, click the like button. Helps out a great deal. And, of course, subscribe if you want to see more in the future. There will be a link in the video description below to pick up Creepy Castle on Steam. For now, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.